Sounds good. All right, so I need to share my screen. Where's the share? There. All right. There's that. Okay. Nope. There. All right. So welcome everybody. I'm super excited to um, share with you tonight about pest um, protection or pest preventatives for our pets and why we recommend natural products. My name is Sherry Willingham and um, tonight we're going to talk about uh, my background and why I'm here. Um, we're going to talk about why a healthy pet is an unattractive host for fleas and ticks and all those critters. Um, we'll talk about all the different products that, um, that we have been instructed to use. I've used all of them. Um, and then we're going to talk about the side effects of those products and um, the risks of using them and the risks of not using them. We'll talk about heartworm medicine and then we'll talk about what your options are for um, using natural products. All right, so to start, I am a crazy dog mom. I love animals of all kinds, uh, but dogs are kind of my specialty. I don't have any professional um, certifications or uh, education that qualifies me as a medical practitioner. Um, I do have a lot of experience and I do a lot of research. Um, so I am self-taught and I encourage everybody else to, um, to do the same thing and really you know, look at things uh, in, in a more natural way. I'm a mom and a grandma, and my background is uh, in business. I worked in uh, an aerospace company for 20 years, and I've always really loved um, natural health. I've always really looked at food as being an important um, way to stay healthy. And when I found essential oils, um, that was just, uh, like the next level of being able to improve my health and um, have control over my environment, my home, my body, um, my pets. And I just love teaching other people um, how, the, how they can do that, what options they have. And then also um, I love helping other people do what I'm doing and um, enjoy the business of doTERRA. All right, so the first thing is, have you ever seen one of the like National Geographic programs where they have wild animals and um, have you ever seen one of those animals that's decimated by ticks and fleas or mosquitoes? Um, so in the wild, animals don't have those issues because they're healthy. Um, the ones that are not healthy are the ones that are going to be vulnerable to those types of um, insects. So what is a healthy pet? Um, a healthy pet, it's just like a healthy person, is, um, has a strong immune system. And the way that there is a strong immune system is uh, there are limited, I just wanna make sure that um, if somebody tries to come on that I'll be able to see them. Um, okay, well, um, so the way you have a strong immune system is to limit processed foods or increase whole foods. Um, we look at species appropriate diets. So um, for humans, it's going to be, um, you know, whole proteins and grains and fruits and vegetables and, you know, um, not, not a lot of stuff that's in boxes that has 30 different things on the list of ingredients. Um, 
or some of those fast food places that um, have those types of foods that they serve you. Um, for pets, the unprocessed species appropriate diet for them is meat because our dogs are carnivores, same with cats. And they, uh, their bodies are meant to process um, meat or other animals. So that helps with a strong immune system. Um, another way to keep the immune system strong is vaccinations. So uh, I understand that um, there are vaccinations that are required and it's really good to know um, how to limit them. So um, for instance, titer testing, um, if my dog ever has to have shots, you know, there's three different shots. I'm going to space them out. I'm not going to do all three at one time, things like that. So that helps uh, to not stress the immune system. And then the last way to keep the immune system strong is to limit the uh, internal and external toxins. So that includes um, our food. Um, you know, the, the food that has the GMOs is also going to have a lot of the pesticides in it. Um, so that's an internal way that they get it. Um, the uh, pest control, um, we have the, uh, the topical and um, also they have the internal, the chewables. Um, either one of those is introducing toxins into the body, stressing the immune system. The next way that toxins come into the, um, into, um, the body is cleaning products. Household cleaning products have so many different toxins in them. And so um, we're all breathing them in. Um, we're absorbing them into our skin. Our pets, you know, um, they absorb things through uh, their pads of their feet. Um, one of the worst ones is um, a dryer sheet. Um, those just load up all of our laundry with toxins and, you know, we, we clean our, our pets beds and blankets and all of that. And we use dryer sheets and we're just telling them to lay in toxins. So that's one other thing that we like to recommend removing. And then of course, air fresheners, everybody loves to have a fresh smelling um, space. Um, and the ones that we buy at the store are just loaded with um, fragrance, which equals toxins. So those are the things that I like to talk about. If we're looking at a healthy pet, these are the things that we need to consider for the um, immune system. So the things that we've been using and I have used all of them. Um, and these are the things that if we go to the vet, that's most likely what they're gonna tell us to use, um, are uh, these products. And basically what we're told is to protect our pets, we need to put pesticides, insecticides, and poisons on them. And stepping back and thinking, okay, wait a minute, what? How does that make sense? So that's what I'm here to talk about is what does that really mean and what else can we do? So I wanna go through how the flea and tick products work. Um, and it's really simple, um, either ingested or topically, the uh, pesticide goes into our pet's body. Um, it's either gonna absorb through the skin or it's gonna go into the stomach. And these toxins enter the bloodstream and then they're circulated all over the body. And they end up concentrated in the muscle tissue. So when one of these little critters goes and bites the pet, they get some of the poison from the muscle tissue and 
it's a, a neurological, it's a neurologic, uh, neural, it, it paralyzes them. It's a neurotoxin, sorry. Um, and um, it paralyzes them and then they die. So first interesting tidbit is these critters have to bite the animal in order to get the toxins. So I was always led to believe that if I'm using these products, these little critters are not gonna come around. So in fact, the only way that the little critters can be killed off is if they bite the animal. So for instance, if we're worried about Lyme disease with ticks and you say, oh no, 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 I use frontline. Well, your pet can still get bit by that tick that has Lyme disease. It's just going to die. Are you okay? <laughs> I'm okay. It just, it's, it's mind blowing to me. Oh, oh yeah, I know it is. <laughs> Yes. That's what my reaction is. Oh, okay. It's just mind blowing to me. Mm -hmm. People don't think about that. Like they still have to get bit and yeah, that, that tick might die, but it could have also just given your dog Lyme disease. Right. Right. And I didn't know any of this stuff. I mean, I, I never really gave it much thought. I just, I, I just knew at some level that it wasn't a good thing, but I didn't know why. Um, and so really trying to look into it and um, get a better understanding so that I could help other people understand. And then they could make a, an informed decision. You know, knowledge is power. And um, so if we know these things, then we can decide what we want to do, especially for our pets. We just are so, um, so willing to, um, to do things to make sure that we take good care of them. So these are some of the symptoms of pesticide poisoning in pets. And one of the things that is problematic is there are a lot of vets who um, don't agree that these products can cause medical issues. Um, and so this is another area where it's really important to be your animal's advocate. You know, the vet says, oh, I've never seen an animal in 25 years have a problem. Okay, well, maybe they had the problem and you just didn't put the two together that that's what caused it, but that's okay because I'm taking care of my pet, they're in good health and they don't need this product. So some of the um, uh, symptoms of pesticide poisoning, um, can be, you know, lack of appetite, um, but it can also be convulsions and seizures. And I'm in a group um, that has uh, uh, people who are trying to figure out how to help their pets with their seizures. And um, one of the things that, that has come up repeatedly is that um, these products have been related to, like, you know, I took um, the pill yesterday and today my dog's having seizures. Um, the other thing is, oh, you're raising your hand. I don't want to interrupt you. No, go ahead. I'm not uh, good at the, at the Zoom. <laughs> For example, like um, I have a family member whose dog has frequent seizures mm -hmm. and you know, she's not educated on this stuff. So she relies on her vet. Mm -hmm. She refuses to take off the Seresto collar. She refuses to even think about the heartworm medication. And her vet mm -hmm. literally told her that her dog could get salmonella if she did a raw food diet. So like vets who aren't educated on this kind of stuff or ignorant to it could you know, it's, it's tough when we have to advocate for our pets, but we aren't mm -hmm. educated on this. Like, like you are. And that's why I do these classes. That's why I stop people in the street and talk to them about their dogs because I know everybody wants to do what's best for their animal. And, and we don't know because we just go by what we're told from the veterinary industry. And I learned through my own personal medical um, journey that 
uh, conventional medicine doesn't approach things the way that is in my best interest. Um, the conventional medicine um, institution treats symptoms with medicine. I like to look at things as how can I help support health without medicine? And so that's, that's what I try and um, get people to, to open their mind to and you know, see if there are, are other ways that they can do things. Um, the other thing that is really scary is uh, if you have an animal that is having seizures is to introduce one of these products into their body because it's just, it's, it's a ticking time bomb. I mean, you're just asking for an explosion. And, um, and the reality is that a, a lot of these products um, are, are not necessary depending on your pet, where you live, all of those things. So just know that there's a bunch of different um, symptoms that can be caused by um, these, these different pesticides. So one way we know for sure that um, there's a problem is in 2018, the FDA issued a warning saying that um, these flea and tick products have the potential for neurological events. So they, they, they did put the warning out there. Um, they didn't take the products off the market. And what they, what they did um, for these big companies that make these products and all the money that they make is they told them that they needed to include a warning label on their products that say these products could cause neurological events. Um, as far as I know, only one of the companies, um, uh, let's see, NextGuard, Credelia, and um, Brevecto, only one of those companies has put the warning label on their package. Um, the other two said that they're waiting um, for their next uh, packaging um, change. So, you know, there's an FDA warning, but it's, it's, it, it, it's such a small slap on the wrist for these companies and the veterinarians still are not aware of it. So again, we have to advocate for our animals. Um, this breaks down the FDA warning a little bit more. Um, Simparica, Nexgard, Bovecto, Credalia. Um, these are all the same group of drugs. Um, due to the increasing number of reported seizures, the FDA issued the report. Um, like I was saying, they, they told the companies that they had to change the, the product labeling. Oh, look, this is just what I was talking about. Um, and so far, NextGuard is the only one um, that has complied with changing uh, their label. All right, so the other one, people say, okay, well, I'm not gonna use one of those topicals or internals, so I'm gonna use a Soresto collar. Well, that's a problem too, because of the active ingredients in the, the, um, the collar that cause all kinds of problems. Um, cancer, autoimmune, respiratory, the list goes on and on. You know, the United States is so far behind um, Europe in so many things. You know, they have so, so many products um, and ingredients that are banned that we allow here. And um, we just need to know that we don't have to have them in our homes. And remember with the Soresto collar, it's not just the dog that's wearing it, it's everything that the dog lays on and touches. So the really, the, the, the poison is being shared with the rest of the family. Um, here's some examples of Soresto collars. Um, this poor puppy just had a horrible reaction on his neck. And then this one right here is an owner's leg. She was wearing pants when her dog was wearing the collar and um, laid its uh, head on her lap. That's the reaction that she had on her leg.
from the Soresto collar. All right, so what about fleas? What's the problem with fleas? We know that they are just obnoxious. We know that um, they uh, can become an infestation and, and it's horrible. Um, and some of our animals have uh, um, an allergy to the flea saliva and their poor little bodies just go um, into systemic uh, um, allergic reaction. So that's one of the problems. Um, another one is uh, an animal can have such bad um, uh, flea bites uh, that they can become anemic um, from the, uh, the blood loss. And then the other one is if a dog ingests the flea eggs, they can develop a tapeworm. So those are all um, problems that can lead to um, other issues that can really uh, affect their health and, and um, it can affect their health and it can, um, I can't think of the word, um, it can endanger their lives. All right. So now we're going to talk about ticks. Um, the first thing I ask people when they are talking to me about, you know, well, what should I use is where do you live? because this whole white area doesn't have any ticks. Um, but there are maps. There are maps that show um, for your specific area, you know, like your county or your, um, um, uh, your state or, or, or whatever. It gives information of what the, the likelihood you know, what, what type of um, population of ticks there are in your area. This is a, a chart of the different diseases based on uh, geographic um, location, based on the, the type of tick, because there's different types of ticks. Um, and so that's really important to look at when you're trying to decide if you need something that is going to um, protect your pet from ticks. And I, I'll put this in the group so that um, this is available for people to look at uh, in a way that they can actually read it and, and use it. One of the things that's really exciting is um, PubMed has a lot of um, research material on it and there's a lot of essential oil research that's um, published on on PubMed and this one has to do with turmeric essential oil being taken internally uh, was shown to prevent tick attachment and that's what we're trying to prevent is the attachment right um, so this is a good one for people who are in an area or have an animal that is susceptible to being around ticks. Now, we have people who have these beautiful little fluffy fur balls that never go outside. They don't need this stuff. They're not gonna get ticks in their house, in their fluffy little bed. They go to the bathroom on their pee pads, you know? So everybody's situation is different. It's not a one size fits all. And, and it's been my experience that that's kind of what, what we see when we go into the vet's office. All right, heartworm. This is a big one um, because it's scary to think that your pet is gonna have those horrendous heartworms. We all see the pictures in the vet's office. It's a really ugly sight. And um, so again, it has to do with where do you live and what is the potential, right? So that's the very first thing that we look at. There's 13 states that carry a high risk for infection. Overall, all of our animals, only actually less than one and a half percent of the dogs in the US test positive for heartworm. And 
um, it, it is, it's really a lot harder to acquire heartworm than we're led to believe. I mean, you know, if, if I just went off of what I heard, I would think that if my dog got bit by a mosquito, then my dog is gonna get heartworm. And the reality is there are so many conditions that have to be in play at the right time for that to happen. You'll see, it's kind of crazy. Um, the other thing is that the heartworm preventatives just like the other products are not harmless. These are chemical pesticides, right? The other thing is that just like with us, with antibiotics and stuff, our bodies become resistant. They stop, to, they stop working. So then they have to, you know, you, t you give them the, the toxin um, and it doesn't work, but they've got the toxin in their body and, um, so then the companies have to figure out, okay, we have to change um, the, the pesticide to be able to actually kill the heartworm. So just know that, you know, that they, they don't always work, even if you are giving it. Um, so what I do for my pups, instead of giving them heartworm medication is, and, and it's, supposed to be given every month, just like the flea and tick. Give it every month regardless, right? Well, the way that the heartworm medicine works is if there's heartworm larva in the blood, then the heartworm medication will kill the larva. But I'm giving it to him every month, even though he doesn't have the larva. So that doesn't make sense. So what I do is I have a blood test done very easy. They, they draw the blood, they check to see if there's any um, uh, heartworm in the blood. And then they come back and they say no. And you go right on, we're good. Um, and then we go get it tested, you know, again, four months later. Um, it's actually not any more expensive to have that blood test done than it is to buy the medicine. And clearly it's going to be a lot less um, of a problem for our pet's health. Um, they have the, the heartworm injections now. They had one on the market that was a, a six month prevention. So you get a shot and your, your animal is good for six months. They took it off the market because there were so many health issues. Um, so many um, dogs were having um, uh, reaction to it. So they took it off the market and they just came back on the market with a 12 month. So now they've doubled it. Um, so again, it, it's not necessary for every animal to have it every month. Everybody needs to look at what their specific situation is and figure out what's going to work for you. All right. Okay. So this is crazy. This is, these are all the things that have to be in play at the same time for your animal to get heartworm. All right, first of all, the mosquito has to be female. It can't be a male. Um, there are certain species of mosquitoes that have, um, that, that allow the development um, of the heartworm in their body but not all of them do. So it has to be one of, it has to be female and it has to be one of these species of mosquitoes, okay? And then the mosquito has to be a species that feeds on mammals and not all of them do. Then the mosquito must have bitten an animal that is infected with stage one heartworms two weeks prior to them being bitten, right? So this animal was infected. The mosquito bit the animal and then two weeks after they bit that animal is when they bite your animal. That's how a, a, a dog 
gets bit and gets heartworm. All of those things have to happen. It's not a mosquito bites your animal and they get heartworm. All of those other things have to happen, right? We know what happens and those poor pups that you know are, are out in rural areas and, and they live outside and they're probably bitten by mosquitoes 50 times a day that get heartworm. But that's different from our pets who are inside the majority of the day. So the, the heartworm is not as easy to, um, to get as, as we would be um, led to believe. There's one more criteria for the heartworm is the temperature. So the temperature has to be right in order for the mosquito that bites your animal to have the heartworm larva that they um, inject into your animal. If the temperature during the two weeks that the mosquito is carrying that larva around, if it ever dips below 57, the larva is dead, right? It's crazy. Um, and then of course, humidity and standing water, you know, um, if, if you live in an area that doesn't have much uh, humidity or standing water, you're pretty, pretty clear um, as far as the mosquitoes and, and getting heartworm. So it, I just want to make sure that you understand that we're told that we have to do this stuff and we have to do it every month. Um, but the reality is you need to figure out what the likelihood is in your area for your pet with your pet's health and, and then decide what to do. All right. Um, this was for the year 2020. And this gives another um, uh, map of what, what the prevalence is for your specific area of the United States. And I didn't do other countries, um, but the information is out there. It's not hard to find at all. The other thing I always like to throw out there because Dawn dish soap is always uh, discussed as a great lead treatment. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know what's in Dawn, but it's blue. And um, I don't use it on my dishes. So I'm certainly not gonna use it on my animal. Um, they do use it in uh, critical situations where it's a life and death. And it's really one of the the less toxic things that um, can be used on an animal that is covered in oil and the animal will die from the oil. Um, but as far as uh, fleas, it's, it, it's, not, it's not safe. It's just not safe. And there are so many um, other things that you can use that are safe. Um, I, I recommend Castile soap, um, which is very mild. You can get it unscented. Um, and just use that. All right. So what should I use for my healthy pet to keep the pests away? Just know that if your animal has a strong immune system, which they're gonna get with a species appropriate diet, that means that they have really good gut health, right? Good gut flora bacteria, and you have reduced the toxins that they are um, exposed to, then in order to keep the, the pests away um, and it's gonna be more minimal pests, right? They're not gonna have an infestation um, if, if they're healthy because they're not vulnerable. Then with the essential oils, you're looking at um, using a spray that ends up costing you pennies um, per bottle, really. 
the other thing about the essential oils is that they can be used for so many different things. So, you know, if you're getting the, um, the flea and tick products, you can only use those for one thing. If you're getting the essential oils, you can use them for air freshener. You can use them for cleaning. Um, some of them are super for um, muscle and uh, joint discomfort. Um, you can use them to, uh, to deal with feelings of anxiousness. Um, so they're multi-purpose and they last a really long time. So I'm gonna just go through real quick the different essential oils that I like to recommend. And again, depending on your pet, where you live, what your situation is, you're gonna choose different oils to put in your um, spray. So we always start with Terra Shield. It's the outdoor blend. It's um, the essential oil blend that doTERRA created as a, um, a pest uh, deterrent. It has um, ylang ylang, cedarwood, uh, lemon eucalyptus, arborvitae, couple other ones, um, but this is a really good one. It comes in, uh, you can get it in a spray bottle and just, um, just spray yourself with it. I like to use that as the base. Um, and I think adding some of these other ones are important um, when we're talking about our animals being outside. Cedar wood is really important because it um, kills flea eggs. So that's always the issue if there's fleas, you know, you can get rid of the fleas, but the eggs are still there. Um, so that's why cedar wood is really good in this spray. Lemongrass, and, uh, um, insects hate lemongrass. Um, I don't know about you, but I love the smell of lemongrass. Um, so I, I love diffusing it, um, but I also use it for muscle and joint um, discomfort. It's really good for a massage. Um, so lemongrass is always one that I recommend putting in the flea and tick spray. Peppermint oil, this is another one. Have you ever seen a um, peppermint plant that has been decimated by bugs? You know, it's one of those invasive plants and um, bugs hate it. <laughs> So that's another one that's really good to put in the spray. This is not uh, one that you would use in a spray uh, for cats. Um, peppermint, we, we don't use with cats, but this one is fantastic for the spray. It also is one of our, um, one of our basic essential oils when people get started because it has so many different um, health benefits. Like it says here, head tension, um, excess body heat, digestive support, respiratory health, um, menstrual cramps, the list goes on and on. And then we talked about turmeric. This one is really good for, um, for people who live in an area where there are a lot of ticks and um, there is the potential for your animal to be exposed this one um, is going to be used not in the spray, but in um, internally. Lavender, this is another one of the basic oils. Uh, this is a, a repellent. Bugs don't like it, but it's also good for skin. It's good for calming. Um, you can see this list here. Um, it's, it's one of the ones that that people get started with because it has so many different uses. Okay, citronella, this is one that came out, um, I think two years ago. And this is a great one to diffuse. Um, if you're sitting outside and uh, there are a lot of pests. So if you have this one, this is a good one to add to your, um, your spray. And then lemon eucalyptus. This one I really like here in Florida because of the um, mosquito repellent um, properties that it has. 
So the lemon eucalyptus, and it's not lemon and it's not eucalyptus, it's lemon eucalyptus. Um, it's 97% effective for four hours in repelling mosquitoes. So this is a really good one. Um, again, you can diffuse it. Um, it smells really nice. It's much better for you than DEET. Um, so this is another one that um, you could use. And then I just put together a couple kits just in case you're looking at all this and go, oh my God, you know, there's so much information. I don't know what to do. Um, so there's a couple different um, kits that you can get. Uh, the first one, the DIY is just five basic oils um, that, you know, unless you have specific uh, requirements, this one's gonna be good for most anybody to create their flea and tick spray. And then um, the pet starter has um, a couple other oils that I snuck down here, Digestin and um, Copaiba. And so this kit um, deals with um, insect repellent, allergies, aches and pains, calming, skin issues, and tummy support. So those just give you an idea of, you know, how you could start if you didn't have anything and you wanted to uh, get started. And then the last thing is, thank you for joining me. I love sharing this information. And I encourage you to do your own research and look for other groups that have experience and that have experience-based research. That's, that's what we do in the natural health world because um, we don't have big companies that are subsidizing um, the research. So we do, we use uh, experience-based research and there's holistic practitioners out there. And go with your gut. We know our animals better than anyone else. And so, um, you know, use your instincts and don't be afraid to stand up for your pet and, and say, no, I need to go look into that first, right? And then of course, enjoy, enjoy Moo every day. We love our, our puppies. All right. So stop share. Stop recording. Um, I'm not gonna stop recording yet because I just wanna say thank you. Reach out to the person that has, um, has introduced you to essential oils and have them help you get set up with um, what is gonna work best for your pet. And um, if there's any way that I can help um, assist with that information, I'm always happy to do it. And please share this with your friends. Please let your friends know that there are other ways to help our animals that are not always uh, what we're told in the vet's office. Did you have anything that you wanted to add, Dorothy? No? I don't think so. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop the recording now.